Hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on Advanced Evaluation of the Fetal Heart, presented by Dr. Alfred Abuhamad. At the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to discuss anatomic regions of the fetal heart and understand the important role of the three-vessel trachea view and the cardiac axis for detection of congenital heart disease. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Abu Hamad and Kathy Minton have no disclosures. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. Alfred Abu Hamad. Um, thank you, Kathy. Um, if I can, uh, okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, looks great. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I would like to thank um, Kathy Minton for organizing the webinar and the AIUM for asking me to speak to you today. I'm going to talk about um, advanced evaluation of the fetal heart, and primarily I'm going to focus today on the role of the three-vessel trachea view in the evaluation of the normal and abnormal cardiac anatomy. As Kathy had stated, I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. So the three-vessel trachea view, um, a very important view that I'm going to take most of the time to discuss and describe to you. And I'll tell you that uh, it is related to seeing the great uh, vessels in their relationship as they come to the descending aorta. And what you would see, and I will go through the anatomy in details, is the pulmonary artery. So this is the anterior chest of the fetus. This is the spine right here, left side and right side. The pulmonary artery is the anterior vessel that gives rise to the ductus arteriosus as it connects with the descending aorta. The ascending aorta is located somewhere in the mid-chest, medially, and then it gives rise to the aortic ismet as it connects with the descending aorta. And these two great vessels meet in a V-shaped configuration at the level of the descending aorta. Lateral to this on the right side is the superior vena cava, and the trachea is seen as an anechoic structure right here. And this view allows you to see the ductal arch and the aortic arch in their relationship to the trachea, the normal relationship being to the left side of the trachea. I will venture to say that this is really a very important view. Now, this may be exaggerating a little bit by saying maybe the only view that you need may be with the four-chamber view. So I'm hoping that I will convince you towards the end of this presentation how important is the three-vessel trachea view in your evaluation of uh, fetal cardiac anatomy. So this slide shows an anatomic specimen at the level of the three-vessel trachea view, the corresponding ultrasound in grayscale mode, 
and the corresponding ultrasound in color Doppler mode. And I want to highlight again the pulmonary artery ascending aorta superior vena cava, the ductal arch, the aortic ismuth to the descending aorta. And here in this view, you see the azagut vein actually as it drains into the superior vena cava. Note the location of the trachea and the ductal arch and the aortic arch are to the left side of the trachea. So if you look at the AIUM guidelines for the performance of the fetal echocardiography exam, you would see that the three-vessel trachea view is included. The three-vessel trachea view is not listed, however, in the basic obstetric ultrasound exam. It only states, the AIUM guidelines state that evaluation of the outflow tracts should be performed, but do not specify which views to use for the outflow tract. If you look at the ISWAG guidelines for the performance of the obstetric ultrasound exam, you see that the three-vessel trachea view is included. Why is this the case? I think the three-vessel trachea view is an easy view to get because it's a transverse slide up into the chest. We like transverse views in obstetrical sonography. That's how we measure abdominal circumference. That's how we look at the four-chamber view. And sliding up into the, the upper chest will display the three-vessel trachea view for you. So it does not require really much rotation, as I will illustrate in a minute. This schematic drawing here shows the relationship in the upper chest of the various views that exist. And I'm going to take this opportunity to show you if you go up from the four-chamber view, which is a view around this plane of the heart, and you slide up into the chest without really doing much rotation, the first view you encounter is the three-vessel view. The classic three-vessel view, as you see, is obtained at the level of division of the pulmonary artery into the right and left pulmonary artery. So what you see is the pulmonary artery, the right pulmonary artery, which courses under the ascending aorta, and the left pulmonary artery going to the left lung. This view is actually difficult to get, in my opinion. It's a very thin slice, and sometimes it's really hard to get. But that's the classic three-vessel view. People misname the three-vessel trachea view as three-vessel view. It's important to note that it is not. The three-vessel view is a view that is a little bit more inferior from the three-vessel trachea view. So if I keep sliding up from this level, and what I, the next view I encounter is what's called the ductal arch view. So three-vessel view, ductal arch view. In the ductal arch view, as the name implies, you would see the pulmonary artery and the ductal arch. And the aorta is on cross-section. Superior vena cava is on cross-section. Here you see the trachea and the esophagus inferior to that. If I keep going up in the chest without doing any rotations, the next view that I get is called the aortic ismuth view or the aortic arch view. This view is the highest view in the chest for the great vessels. You see how the aortic arch curves as the highest great vessel, way above the division of the pulmonary artery. And here you see only two vessels. You see the superior vena cava in cross-section on the right side, and you see the aortic ismuth right here connecting with the descending aorta. Be careful not to mistake this view with an abnormal three-vessel trachea view. And the three-vessel trachea view is actually involves slight rotation, and that rotation to really involve to get the aortic ismuth aligned with the ductus arteriosus. And that's your classic three-vessel trachea view, as I've described briefly before. So I want you to see now the four views that exist in the upper chest, going from the three-vessel view to the ductal arch view, the aortic ismuth view, and then the three-vessel trachea view. Note that the three-vessel trachea view involves a slight tilt to the left side of the fetus. So again, let me show you all these views in real time. Here's your three-vessel view. You see the division on color Doppler of the pulmonary artery here, and you see the pulmonary artery right here with the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery right here, aorta, superior vena cava. And you see the azagus actually slightly coming into the superior vena cava here, and you see it on color Doppler really nicely, bringing blood 
into the spree vena cava. So the vessels bring blood from the posterior aspect of the chest to the mid aspect of the chest. That's the classic three vessel view. Here's the ductal arch view. So the ductal arch view, again, you see the pulmonary artery, the ductal arch connecting with the descending aorta. Here's the trachea right here, cross section of the aorta, cross section of the superior vena cava. A little bit of the azagus is, is demonstrated. Keep going up in the chest without any rotations, you get to the aortic arch view. The aortic arch view here, you see the thymus gland really nicely displayed. You see it right around here. And you see the aortic arch and the supravena cava, and here's the trachea right here. Again, it's a two vessel because we are really high up in the chest above the divisions of the pulmonary artery. Then if you turn, obliquely, slightly to the left side, you get the classic three-vessel trachea view. Pulmonary artery, ductal arch, aorta, aortic ismeth, superior vena cava. I don't see any blood flow in the superior vena cava because I'm at a little bit of a higher velocity to get the blood flow in the great vessels, but you see a little bit of the azagous vein dumping blood into the superior vena cava here. So this is, these are, I want to show you and share with you the various planes in the upper chest of the fetus and how important those views are. And this clip shows you going from the three vessel view to the ductal arch to the three vessel trachea view. And what I want you to focus on, the rotation in the fetal chest here that it involves to get to the three vessel trachea view. So here you see here's the three vessel view, ductal arch and three vessel trachea. And you see how I'm rotating a little bit to, to angle to the left side of the fetus to be able to get the three vessel trachea view together. And my advice to you is to really practice on every patient that you scan looking at, at cardiac anatomy, how to get those views so you become very comfortable in, in obtaining them. Now going up into the chest even higher, beyond the aortic arch view, you will encounter the brachiocephalic vein. So what is the brachiocephalic vein? So we all start with two parallel venous system, a right brachiocephalic vein and a left brachiocephalic vein, and a right superior vena cava and a left superior vena cava. The left superior vena cava actually dis disappears during development, and the blood that is coming from the left jugular and the left subclavian veins cross the chest from the left side to the right side through the left brachiocephalic vein and dump into the superior vena cava. So there is a chest, there is a vessel in the upper chest that runs, as you see here on the, on the anatomy specimen, that runs from, joins the jugular vein and the subclavian and runs across in an almost horizontal plane to join the superior vena cava before it enters the right atrium. You see it here on an anatomy specimen, right inferior to the thymus gland, and you see it on grayscale and color here as a vessel with the blood flow going from left to right. Okay, here what you see are the divisions of the, of the vessels coming out of the aortic arch. Okay? Because the blood is coming from higher levels towards lower, if you see the, the vessel is inclined a little bit downward, so the blood is in opposite direction to the blood flow in the aorta, as you see here. And here's the breakers if I'm going from the aortic ismeth to the brachiocephalic vein. So I'm just sliding up into the chest, even at a level that is higher than the aortic ismeth level. That view is important, as I will show you later, as we try to assess if we have four vessels at the level of the three-vessel trachea view and how we work that out. So keep that in mind. So <clears throat> review of the anatomy before we go into more details. Pulmonary artery, ascending aorta, superior vena cava, ductal arch, aortic ismeth, coming to the descending aorta to the left side of the trachea. The thymus gland it occupies this anatomic region here. And here's an overlapping ultrasound image to show you the same anatomy. What should you look for in a three-vessel trachea? First, you should look at the course and size of the three vessels, right? The pulmonary artery, the aorta, and superior vena cava. Are they there, and are they going in the right direction, and what's their size? We should look at the aortic ismeth and ductus arteriosus. Do they exist first, 
And two, what kind of blood flow do they have? Is it retrograde or forward? And what's the size that they get? Is the aortic arch right-sided or left-sided in relationship to the trachea? Do we see the thymus glands? And as we add color Doppler, what direction of flow do we see? And these are all important things. And do we have extra vessels? Do we have a fourth vessel at the level of the three-vessel trachea view? And is this a persistent left superior vena cava? Or <clears throat> is this a vertical vein, as I would show you, from uh, an anomalous pulmonary venous return? OK, so <clears throat> normal three-vessel trachea view, again, Spine is posterior, pulmonary artery, ductal arch. Here you don't see the aortic arch. I'm a little bit oblique here. But supervena cava, trachea, thymus gland. Again, here's another normal patient. Ductal arch, aortic arch, trachea, supervena cava. You see the azagous vein right here. Color Doppler, very important to show you the flow in the great vessels. Sometimes you see the azagous vein as in here. And if you go a little bit obliquely, you see the thymus gland between the mammarian arteries, as you see right here. What kind of flow should we see in the pulmonary artery and aorta, or ductal arch and aortic isthmus? The flow should be always towards the spine. Remember the aorta, the descending aorta sits right anterior to the spine, so the flow should be towards the descending aorta. So if the spine is posterior, you should see blue color in both. If the spine is anterior, you should see red color in both. Now, I will, uh, <clears throat> will kind of adjust this by saying a little bit, if you are at a 9 degree angle, if you are at a 9 o'clock angle to the spine, one vessel on rare occasions may be different color than the other. You always have to figure out your insulating angle and are you perpendicular to one vessel or one is is more oblique to the other. But in the greatest majority of cases, both vessels will show you the same color, and the color will be towards the spine. Here's a clip showing you going from the fourth chamber view <coughs> to the three-vessel trachea view, as you see right here. Very, very important view for the evaluation of the great vessels in early gestation. I cannot overemphasize how important, if you are looking at the, fe at the fetus in more details in the first trimester and looking at the anatomy, and if you're looking at cardiac anatomy in the first trimester and maybe early second trimester, 12, 13, 14, 15, maybe 16 weeks, the three-vessel trachea view, in my opinion, especially at earlier gestations at 11, 12, 13, is very, very important because it's much easier to get and it allows you to see the relationship of the great vessels. Looking at this fetus at 11 weeks, I could tell you that I'm reassured that there are two great vessels that are equal in size that have forward flow in them. So I've ruled out a lot of conotruncal anomalies that can be of serious consequences. I put this to show you how the three-vessel trachea view is in relationship to the aorta. So I want you to see the ascending aorta here. And look at the curve that it does to come to the aortic isthmus right at this level. This is the aortic arch, right? That's the curve that it takes to the aortic arch to curve and come down to the left side. So keep that in mind as you look at how does the, the, the ascending aorta ends up into the aortic isthmus. It makes a fairly sharp curve in the upper chest. And here's a 3D to show you the relationship of the great vessels as they come out of the heart. So, we are going to look at the number of vessels. Are they normal or abnormal? And if they are abnormal vessel size, is the vessel large or small? And do we have abnormal numbers? Do we have abnormal course and alignment? Is one vessel discontinuous and doesn't continue all the way to the descending aorta? What kind of flow we have? And many times when you have major anomalies, there are several signs that are present together. And hopefully through the rest of the presentation, I will show you some examples of what to look for and what's the significance of what you are seeing. So we see three vessels at the three-vessel trachea, but one of the vessels is small. So here we are seeing the pulmonary artery, the ductal arch. We see the aorta. We see the superior vena cava. Here's the trachea. But look at the size of the aorta in relationship to the pulmonary artery. 
So what could give me a small aorta, but there's forward flow in it. So here I'm thinking about aortic stenosis, and I'm thinking about uh, uh, maybe coarctation of the aorta. So these are the two things I'm thinking about. So I put here coarctation of the aorta, but it could be mild aortic stenosis. On this view, on the B panel, I see a pulmonary artery of normal size, maybe slightly increased. I see a small aorta, but there's reverse flow in the aorta, as you see. Remember, the spine is posterior. Flow should be blue right here. I see a trachea and a spherical. So what could give me reverse flow in the aortic isthmus? I'm automatically thinking about hypoplastic left heart. I'm thinking about critical coarctation of the aorta. I'm thinking about critical aortic stenosis. On rare occasions in the third trimester, I'm thinking about severe IUGR, fetal growth restriction, with reverse flow at the level of the aortic isthmus. All right, so let me show you examples of coarctation of the aorta. This is an anomaly that is really hard to detect, and there's a lot of false positives and false negatives associated with it. Typically, what we see is we see, as you look right here, discrepancy in size between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. This is typically the first clue to the presence of coarctation of the aorta in the third trimester, or even in the first trimester, as a matter of fact. So you look at this, and you suspect, OK, now I need to evaluate the aorta. I want to evaluate um, um, the aortic arch. Next step, you put color on. And typically, you see, in classic cases of coarctation, some regurgitation across the tricuspid valve. And the reason for this is that there's more blood flow now coming to the right side of the heart than normally there is. And that is commonly associated with a little bit of tricuspid regurgitation. That goes along with the right side, right side, the, the size of the right ventricle as opposed to the left. Then if I'm lucky enough and the spine is posterior, as you see here, I could then find where the coarctation is and make the diagnosis of the coarctation. And many times, even with all these findings, there's a false positive effect. But what is really helpful is the three-vessel trachea view is a view that is commonly uh, unobstructed by, um, by shadowing from bones. And in that view here, I see in the same patient reverse flow in the aortic isthmus. So in the third trimester, I rely heavily on the three-vessel trachea view in making the determination whether there's coarctation of the aorta or not. All right, so here's a three-vessel trachea view where I see, frankly, if you look on the, here, this is the anterior vessel. So this is the pulmonary artery right here. I barely see a very thin and narrow aorta here, and I see this pevena cava here. So I'm very suspicious of a hypoplast. Of course, I've probably done that looking at the four chamber view, but evaluating the great vessels here, you see reverse flow again in a very tiny vessel of the aorta. Many times the grayscale image does not allow you to see the vessel, especially with severe uh, narrowing of the aorta or the aortic arch. The color doppler is very helpful because it often shows you retrograde flow in that vessel you're looking at. Here's another patient here. The spine is now at 9 o'clock right here. See the size of the pulmonary artery and look at the size of the aorta. And look at the flow in the aorta going all the way back into the heart. So this is another case of hypoplastic left heart with a very narrow aorta and retrograde flow in the aorta. Keep in mind that hypoplast, you are going to suspect it at the four-chamber view. So what is the value of the three-vessel trachea view? Really to find the pattern of flow in that vessel and how significantly narrow that vessel is. But the three-vessel trachea view has a lot of advantages in different situations. Here's an interrupted aortic arch, where if you look on grayscale, the pulmonary artery appears normal. And I follow the aorta, and the aorta does not connect all the way to the descending aorta. And it's actually is abruptly stopped right at that level. And on color Doppler, you can demonstrate that too. So that's an interrupted aortic arch. It could be much easier to diagnose looking at the three-vessel trachea view than you would trying to assess the, the how, where the aorta is and whether the aorta curves back as an arch and gives up the head and neck vessels. OK, so I see three vessels now. We talked about seeing three vessels and the aorta small. Now I see three vessels, but the pulmonary artery is small. As you see right here, 
Look at the size of the pulmonary artery in relationship to the aorta. Remember, the pulmonary artery should be at least equal, if not slightly larger than the aorta, the ascending aorta. But there is forward flow. There is anti-grade flow in this vessel. What comes to mind is pulmonary stenosis. Pulmonary stenosis with still forward flow in the pulmonary artery, very commonly seen in tetralogy of Fallot. So tetralogy of Fallot at the level of the three-vessel trachea view will show you an enlarged aorta because there's increased blood flow coming now from right and left ventricle. But the pulmonary artery will be diminutive in size, but still will show you forward flow in the pink type tetralogy of Fallot. If you have reverse flow in the pulmonary artery, as you see right here, the spine is posterior, ascending aorta, right here, aortic isthmus, and there's reverse flow through the ductus into the pulmonary artery. You start thinking about pulmonary atresia here. In cases of pulmonary atresia, it could be a blue type tetralogy of Fallot or just cases of pulmonary atresia. Here's an example of a tetralogy of Fallot. Aorta is large. Look at the size of the aorta right here. Here's the pulmonary artery is narrow. It's narrower than the aorta. And you have to be a little bit more uh, attentive to this detail to figure out that the pulmonary artery should be at least equal, if not larger. But that's a narrower uh, pulmonary artery. That's a tetralogy of Fallot case. Here's another case of tetralogy of Fallot here also. And uh, let me move on. The other one you could see on the, it's easier. So here you see cross section of the aorta right here. This is the three vessel view, the classic three vessel view. And here's the pulmonary artery. Look at the narrowing. You know, in tetralogy of Fallot, it's subinfundibular stenosis, right? And here you see the, the infundibulum that is moved a little bit towards the annulus of the pulmonary artery, resulting in its narrowing. So that's your classic pulmonary stenosis in tetralogy of Fallot. And this is a, a tomographic view showing all the relationship of the great vessels. I will take you to the middle one where the three vessel view is right here, and look at the size of the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery is still most anterior than the aorta, but look at the size of the aorta in relationship to the pulmonary artery. And that's the three-vessel trachea view here, and look at the size of the ductal arch in relationship to the aorta. And here you see an overriding aorta really over the septum, confirming that. Now be careful. Here I am all the way superior at the aortic ismuth, aortic arch view. So this is not an abnormal view where I don't see the pulmonary artery. This is I'm very superior in the chest. And here I am at the aortic arch view. And look at the size of the aorta. That's why it's, it can be seen quite easily. And here's another case of pulmonary atresia showing your reverse flow in the pulmonary artery. This is in the third trimester. And it becomes very difficult on grayscale to see those. Color Doppler is really helpful in that setting. So what if I see three vessels? But one of the vessels is really large, and the pulmonary artery is quite large, as you see right here. Think about absent pulmonary valve syndrome. In absent pulmonary valve syndrome, there's a lot of flow that's going back and forth through the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery is enlarged, and typically the, the branches of the pulmonary artery are really enlarged, as you see right here. So now I see only two vessels at the three-vessel trachea view. So there's one vessel that is missing. So I see two vessels, but the vessel that I see is of normal size, as you see right here. So I'm at the level of the three-vessel trachea view, and I only see one vessel. I see the superior vena cava, so that's the two vessels to the left side of the trachea. But there's something missing here. And color Doppler, as you could see, confirms that. There's no other vessel. If that vessel is of normal size, so there's no hemodynamic exchange of blood between the right and the left ventricle, Think about transposition of the great arteries. Because in transposition of the great arteries, the vessels now, the pulmonary artery is now inferior to the aorta. And at the level of the three-vessel trachea view, you only see two because it's right beneath the aorta at this level. OK, so that's a classic view for transposition of the great arteries at the level of the three-vessel trachea view. In my opinion, this is much easier to see and suspect the presence of transposition than looking at the LVOT view. Because at the LVOT view, you really have to follow the vessel up in the chest to see that the vessel divides to make you suspicious that this is the pulmonary artery coming from the left ventricle. Here, when I look at the three-vessel trachea view, I see that there's only one vessel rather than two great arteries. And that vessel is normal in size. I'm really suspicious 
that this is transposition. So here's a case of transposition at 13 weeks. Again, diagnosed by the three vessel trachea view. Here's another patient at 13 weeks. And look here. I see only one vessel coming down. This is the, the superior vena cava here. And look at that. And that's the trachea. And that vessel is normal in size. So that's a classic case of transposition of the great artery. And here's another case right here. If I go up and down, you see the one vessel. And then I'm going inferior to show you the divisions of the pulmonary artery right inferior to that vessel. Now, on some occasions, on some occasions, not all transposition of the great arteries will have two vessels at the three-vessel trachea view. In my experience, the majority of them will have only two vessels. That's your classic transposition. And that is what you will see you would see only two vessels. And that vessel that you see is normal in size and has this characteristic convex shape to it. And that determines that that's the aorta. So these are classic signs for transposition. But as I mentioned, not all transpositions <coughs> will have only two vessels. On occasions, you may have, as you see, this is another case of transposition. And I see three vessels at the three-vessel trachea view. But what, and that's in the maybe less than 5% of transposition cases. This is de dependent on the, on the relationship on the uh, relationship of the great vessels anatomically to each other. But what is the key to the diagnosis? The key to the diagnosis here is that the aorta is still more anterior than the pulmonary artery. So classically, at the three-vessel trachea view, if you remember, the pulmonary artery is anterior. The aorta is in the middle, three minute cava below. Here you would see that the aorta is more anterior, closer to the chest wall than the pulmonary artery is. So keep that in mind that it's, these are side-by-side -side uh, transposition. They are uncommon, but the clue to the diagnosis is that the aorta is still more anterior. So now if I see two vessels, but that vessel I see is large. So I see one great vessel that is enlarged. So what do you think about? Think about common arterial trunk. Remember in common arterial trunk, there's one vessel that comes out of the heart and then gives branches to the pulmonary artery and then the aorta. So that vessel would look really large at the three-vessel trachea view, such as this. And you would see a lot of these bifurcations coming out of it. It looks like a spider, because these are all the pulmonary arteries right, coming out from one side and the other. And here's another case right here. And if you look here, you see the divisions of pulmonary artery branches. But look at the size of this single vessel coming out. So when you see two vessels rather than three, the size becomes really important, because if it's normal and has this convex shape, Think about transposition. If it is really, really, really large and has these branching coming out of it, think about common arterial trunk. All right, so now I uh, want to talk about the course of the great vessels as they come out of their respective chambers. This is the normal three-vessel trachea view. Both the ductal arch, aortic arch, are to the left side of the trachea. They can both be on the right side. And this is called right aortic arch and right ductal arch, OK? They, one could be on the left side, and one could be on the right side. This could be a right aortic arch and a left ductus arteriosus. So this forms a U configuration behind the trachea. This is like a loose ring. Typically, patients tolerate this very well, don't need any intervention afterwards. Or you can have a double aortic arch. Here's the aorta divides into right and left aorta and encircles the trachea, as you see right here. This is not easy to diagnose, but these ba babies need some intervention early on because of tracheal compression. So it's really important to make this diagnosis if you can prenatally. And you can do that at the three-vessel trachea view. Here's your classic abnormal course with right-sided aortic arch and a, a right-sided ductus arteriosus. So I have the ductus arteriosus the aortic arch onto the right side of the trachea, as you see right here. You have to assess those patients for associated uh, problems, especially related to the George and, and other abnormalities. So it really warrants uh, an, a full evaluation of the heart and of the thymus gland and other abnormalities. Here's what's called a right-sided aortic arch and a left-sided ductus arteriosus. Again. It forms a U-shape surrounding the trachea. And here you see it in a clip. And you see where the aortic arch is. And the trachea in the middle, there's no blood flow in it, and the ductal arch on the side. So you have to go obliquely to kind of curve it in here and to show the U configuration. And you have to be very careful that there's no other vessel that comes out from the aorta right here. 
Here's another U configuration here. You can clearly see the U because we're perpendicular to it. We can see a lot of the flow posteriorly. Many times when you insonate from the chest anteriorly, you're perpendicular to the flow behind the trachea, so you may not see it. If you go obliquely, you can see the whole uh, circle surrounding the trachea. Here's a double aortic arch. There's a left and right aortic arch around the trachea. And look at this clip right here. So here's the aorta coming out. There's a left ductus arteriosus clearly seen. But look how the aorta divides, and you can form the circle all the way around. It is not easy to see this because many times this left branch could be hypoplastic or small, or this right branch unlikely, but could be hypoplastic and small. So, so you have to be really cautious and you have to angle a little bit obliquely here, reduce your gain, your, increase your gain and reduce your velocity scale as much as possible to allow you to see the flow there. So that's a classic double aortic arch and that's a 3D showing you the classic aortic arch. All right, now we see four vessels. So we see the pulmonary artery, ductal arch, aorta, aortic isthmus, previna cava, and then there's another vessel on the other side, on the left side. Most commonly, this is a persistent left suprevena cava. Remember when we started, we talked about the left brachiocephalic that takes blood from the jugular and the subclavian to the right suprevena cava. In many situations, there is a persistent left suprevena cava, so by definition, there is no brachiocephalic vein, correct? Because blood is draining through the persistent suprevena cava. Most of the time, this ends up in the coronary sinus in the heart, and then you can see that. But it's really important. So when you see an additional vessel, your first thought should be this is a probably a left suprevena cava. Statistically, that's the most common. However, you need to so, so that, as I mentioned, is associated with absence of the brachiocephalic vein. But how do you know that this is not the vertical vein of a supracardiac total anomalous venous return? So what does that mean? In this schematics here, you see the pulmonary veins coming into a confluent vein behind the heart. They're not draining to the left atrium. And then there's a vertical vein that's taking them up connecting them with the brachiocephalic, and it's coming down into the SVC. This is one of the most common forms of total anomalous pulmonary venous return. And it shows you at the level of the three-vessel trachea view, it shows you an additional vessel there. So how do I make the difference between the two? Well, clearly, one very important distinction is the blood flow in the vertical vein is in opposite direction to the suprevena cava. So if you reduce your velocity scales, as you can see, I have turbulence here in the pulmonary artery and aorta, but I'm interested in the venous flow. And I document that blood in the suprevena cava is coming towards the heart, whereas blood in this extra vessel is going away from the heart. That's the most important way to differentiate. But let's look at two other things. So there's a fourth vessel. Is this the left suprevena cava? Well, remember, it dumps into the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus will be enlarged, as you see right here. Coronary sinus, you get it slightly inferior to your four-chamber view, and you don't have a brachiocephalic vein. So I've confirmed now, and certainly if you add color and document same flow as the suprevena cava, same flow directions, then that's your diagnosis. Here is, on the next slide, uh, uh, the, let me come back to it, sorry. So here on the next slide is the total anomalous venous return. So uh, uh, where is the next one? Right here. So what you see here is the coronary sinus will be normal because, but the brachiocephalic vein will be quite dilated because now the pulmonary venous circulation is coming up through the brachiocephalic to come down to the heart through the suprevena cava. So three things to use. Color Doppler with low velocity scales to look at direction of flow. Look at the coronary sinus and look at the brachiocephalic vein and that helps you differentiate the fourth vessel as a persistent left suprevena cava or a supracardiac type total anomalous venous return. On occasions, you see kinking in the ductus arteriosus. This is quite common, especially in the third trimester. This looks like a fourth vessel. These are normal findings. So you could see here, look at this at the three vessels. Oh my god, look at this ductus arteriosus. It's going curving all the way around before it connects with the descending aorta. And look on color Doppler. Remember the ductus arteriosus closes shortly after birth. So these are not malformations. We call these normal variants. 
Many times there are sometimes steel phenomenon here, and you may have some abnormalities in the aortic isthmus, but these are rare on occasion. So, so this is, I just want you to show you this example to make sure you don't confuse a, a ductal arteriosis aneurysm or kinking with a fourth vessel at the three vessel shape. Finally, I'm going to talk briefly about the aberrant right subclavian artery because this is diagnosed at the level of the three vessel trachea. So the aberrant right subclavian artery is a vessel that comes from the aorta, curves behind the trachea and the esophagus to the right side, to the right upper extremity. Okay, so you see this at the level of the three vessel trachea view. So what you need to do to see it, here you need to reduce your velocity scale substantially because we're looking with low velocity flow right here. And you would see that vessel coursing behind the trachea to the opposite extremity, as you see right here. Why this is important? There has been some associations with uh, uh, Down syndrome in those, in those cases, with a relative risk somewhere uh, 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 around 3 to 4 uh, likelihood ratio. So, so it's quite, quite significant, actually. So what we do, if we see this, we we, and we, ask, we look at the risk for the patient. That's what we do currently. If the patient is really low risk for, uh, uh, as, a, as part of her Down syndrome screen, especially if she had cell-free DNA and, and those results are normal, then we move on. If the patient is moderate or high risk, then we counsel her about this finding and the option for invasive diagnostic testing are then discussed. Briefly also, I want to mention the study that Dr. Shawi had done looking at the size of the thymus at the three-vessel trachea view by measuring the thymic to thoracic ratio defined from the dome of the ascending aorta or the aortic isthmus to the sternum and then the, 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 the chest from the spine to the sternum. And babies who have small thymus, thymus glands because of the George syndrome or other things will have a very, very uh, low, um, um, uh, will have abnormalities in that ratio as you see here. It is very helpful. We also use the brachiocephalic ratio. We have developed this internally here because the brachiocephalic vein is more constant in, in those babies than the aorta because there may be conotruncal anomalies associated with that and the aorta may look uh, abnormal and difficult to measure. So how important is the three-vessel trachea view or the three-vessel views in the upper chest in the evaluation of anomalies. This is a study from Thailand that showed that it is quite abnormal in a long, in a large, in at least 75 or 70 to 75 percent of fetuses with congenital heart disease. And if you take out ventricular septal defects, the detection rate of these views are somewhere close to 90 percent for congenital heart disease. In our experience internally here in the first trimester also, we found fairly similar results. It's very, very important view, in my opinion, because of the ease with which you can get it, and also because of the information you can get in a very short approach. So, I have shown you during this presentation that the three-vessel trachea view is abnormal in a lot of anomalies, in the hypoplastic left and right heart, in many conotruncal anomalies, such as transposition, double outlet, tetralogy, common arterial trunk, in the supracardiac type of total anomalous venous return, which is the most common, pulmonary atresia, stenosis, coarctations, aberrant right subclavian and venous abnormalities, and also in right or left aortic arches, certainly in Epstein because of the associated with pulmonary stenosis and with interrupted aortic arch. So the three vessel trachea view, in my opinion, is one of the most important ultrasound views in the fetus for fetal cardiac evaluation. It is easy to obtain, especially in early gestation. It is really easy to obtain in early gestation because uh, um, the fetus usually presents itself with the spine posterior or with the excessive movement. You can get into that plane fairly easily. The anatomic landmarks are easy to identify and master, and it is affected in most major congenital heart disease. And it should be strong consideration, I'm hoping, to incorporating this in the screen examination. And I'm hoping to, to be effective advocate for this view to really enhance our ability to look at the heart and also to diagnose more conotruncal anomalies than we have done in the past. 
So I'm going to finish with advertising uh, my free uh, ultrasound book. If you have not downloaded it, please do so. The website is openultrasound.com, open ultrasound one word. It's been translated to many languages as you see there, and it's a free download, and I hope that you will find this uh, to be helpful. So I'm going to uh, take some questions now. I think we have um, some time to do questions, so let me look at them and see. Do we have to measure the diameters of the PA and aorta on the level of the three-vessel trachea view? The answer is no. You can just get experience in the, how the normals look and just eyeball them and then, and then subjectively assess the size. What is the earliest gestational age where it's safe to use color power Doppler to evaluate the fetal heart? There are uh, documents that are available on the AIUM website, on the, uh, also on the ISWAG website that talks about this. We try to avoid pulse Doppler in the first trimester because of the increased focused energy on the fetus. Color Doppler in, in a short amount of time is, is safe and has been deemed to be safe and you have to weigh the risk-benefit equation. We recommend to use it to assess the great vessels for a very short period of time and then evaluate the vessels afterwards. Can we treat the TGA inside the uterus? No. So the question was, could we treat transposition of the great arteries? No. And there's no reason if it's diagnosed prenatally and, and, this, and plans are made to deliver the fetus at a, at, a, at a center that are used to caring for those children, I think the outcome is in many situations uh, quite well. In a case with left ductal arch and right aortic arch, could a branch of the aorta coursing on the left side trachea mimic a double aortic arch? The, the question is yes. You could, you could suspect the presence of a double aortic arch erroneously because of the left common carotid, but typically the left common carotid is a little bit higher. These branches are a little bit higher in the chest than that, so most of the time that is not the case. But keep in mind that a double aortic arch could have a hypoplastic side to it, most commonly the left side, so it could appear like a right uh, arch and a left duct arteriosus. So you have to be cautious uh, on that uh, evaluation. In the case of right aortic arch or aberrant right subclavian, cell-free DNA is enough. I think if you have done cell-free DNA for ARSA, that is enough. For right aortic arch, no, because of the 22Q11 deletion. But now some of the cell-free DNAs are able to test for uh, the, this micro deletion. Uh, um, uh, uh, I would be a little bit cautious about the, the sensitivity of this and the false positive. Uh, we are still counseling patients for an amniocentesis primarily rather than cell-free DNA. For ARSA, cell-free DNA, I believe, is, is okay if the patients are low risk, if everything else looks normal on the fetus. How early can the three-vessel trachea view be seen? 10 weeks, 11 weeks with color Doppler, you can get a lot of information then. Certainly after 12 weeks, <clears throat> you can clearly see it in color. After 13 weeks, you can clearly see it on grayscale. You are my idol. Thank you, Luis. It was great to, to know that you're on. Uh, this was a question, sorry. What is the abnormality in three vessel trachea view and double outlet right ventricle? So double outlet right ventricle is complex because of the relationship of the great vessels. And many times you have transposition of the great vessels in association with this, and then you will see one great vessel at the three vessel trachea view. In other situations, they could be side by side, uh, and, and that you could see two vessels. Many times the aorta is anterior uh, to the, to the uh, pulmonary artery. How is the three vessel trachea view affected in heterotaxy? I would say this is related to the abnormalities that exist. So, so uh, heterotaxy that has conotruncal anomalies will have an affected three vessel trachea view. If they don't, then uh, uh, the three vessel trachea view may not be affected. How do we differentiate CAT from pulmonary artery uh, with uh, pulmonary atresia with VST? So in CAT, there are some uh, <clears throat> things that are required for CAT diagnosis. You know, in CAT, there's a central vessel that comes from the heart. Many times there are uh, valve dysplasia there, so you see some regurgitation from the jet. There's many leaflets many times, four, five, or six leaflets there. Two, by definition, the common, in common arterial trunk, the pulmonary artery should not be connected to the right ventricle. So you have to look at that also. And many times you can trace the PA, even though it's, it's atratic, you can trace it to the pulmonary artery in that setting. 
which is better, first trimester color or power Doppler? By far, I would say power Doppler uh, because of its better ability to highlight the vessels and it's not uh, as much angle dependent as color Doppler. In our experience, power Doppler is much more useful in the first trimester than uh, standard color. How to improve prenatal detection of total anomalous pulmonary venous return? I will tell you uh, three important things you need to look at. One is there is look at the area behind the left atrium. On many occasions there is a confluent vein that sits there that actually does not connect to the left atrium where the pulmonary veins come in and then it drains either superiorly as I demonstrated in my example or straight into the right ventricle or inferiorly into the uh, stomach, into the vein, the liver and then up the IVC. Two, there's increased distance from the spine to the posterior wall of the left atrium in cases of total anomalous venous return more so than you see in the normal situation. And three, if you get into the habit of putting pulse Doppler on the pulmonary veins, in total anomalous venous return many times there's venous obstruction and the Doppler tracing can be very telling in those situations. These are the three things that I would recommend uh, to, to look at. Uh, I have your book. It helps a lot. Indeed, thank you. Somebody thank me. You're welcome. Uh, do you need sagittal view of aortic and ductal arches if you have three vessel trachea view? Um, frankly, I would say no. Uh, with the risk that I may be controversial, but I would say no. I would say I'm not sure what the sagittal view of the aortic arch or the ductal arch would add to a normal three vessel trachea view to me. I can't see what it would really add beyond what I could see at the three vessel trachea view. So I would say probably not in my opinion. Uh, if you can get it, uh, uh, you can get it. So these are kind of like, let me see this one. Sorry, spectral Doppler for better temporal evaluation. Spectral Doppler we try to avoid in the first trimester um, uh, because of the focused energy as I have mentioned. Um, and then you have to assess the risk benefit. If there's a malformation, cardiac malformation, then, um, uh, then it's, uh, you know, it's okay to use, uh, but be careful with that. Uh, what is the significance of the area behind the heart? The area behind the left atrium is really important. It's important because of the issue that I've discussed with the total anomalous venous return. And, and remember, this is where the esophagus also crosses, so you have to be cautious. Make sure they don't mistake a dilated esophagus where the, ba the baby just swallowed with an abnormal vessel there. If you wait a little bit, the, the esophagus will, will close, and then you can tell that this was the esophagus you're looking at. Really important in detection of total anomalous venous return. Important detection of interrupted IVCs because the azagous vein would be dilated. Very important anatomic area uh, to look at. Um, let me see if I have missed some of the other questions. Um, when evaluating late first or early second trimester cardiac views, do you find that patients often make decisions based on these findings or wait for more formal fetal echo later on gestation? Very good question. Um, I think it depending what you see. So if I see a hypoplastic left heart with all the characteristic features at 13 weeks and I document it by color and grayscale and, and all the things and uh, I can counsel the patient that this is a hypoplast and, and patients then make decisions based on that what to do. If, uh, if it's a minor abnormality, we always wait for follow-up. We always ask the patient to wait for follow-up because first trimester you know, has not been, been performed for a long time. But there are, there are several abnormalities that can be diagnosed in the first trimester and diagnosed really with consistency. And so I would say based on your level of expertise, based on the quality of the ultrasound that you are doing, and based on the abnormality that you are detecting. Severe abnormalities that are clearly seen in the first trimester, I have no issues in counseling the patients with regards to that. Keep in mind, however, if a patient is coming to you, for instance, to rule out a hypoplastic left heart because she had a family history or had a prior child, and I do an ultrasound in the first trimester, and the heart looks normal, I will tell the patient that the heart is normal, but she's not out of the woods because there has been some cases of hypoplasia that were diagnosed between the first and the second trimester. So there are, we're still learning about what we see in the first trimester, but I could tell you that 
I'm hoping, and if you are certainly you're committed to ultrasound and interested in ultrasound because you're, you're on the webinar, we're going to be doing a lot of more first trimester ultrasounds, I anticipate, in the next five to ten years. And I anticipate that the first trimester ultrasound will play a much bigger role in our evaluation of the fetus, both from an anatomy point of view, but also from a functional and risk assessment point of view into the future. Okay, let me see if I have missed. Uh, I think I have addressed uh, really all the questions that have been posed. Let me go back to the bottom, see if anybody. Are you performing fetal cardiac surgery in your center? Uh, not, no, we are not. There are a handful of places around the country that primarily do aortic uh, stenosis, uh, balloon dilation. Uh, uh, the other operation that is done is uh, opening a restrictive uh, foramen ovale. Uh, these are the two that are more consistently done, but beyond that, I'm not aware of more extensive cardiac surgery that is uh, being performed. Do you recommend screening of the fetal heart of the OV obese gravida? Well, um, um, good question. There is increased risk of congenital heart disease. It is not part of the national uh, criteria for fetal echo, certainly for fetal screening, I would say certainly for a detailed ultrasound exam, 76811. There's a window between 12 and 15 weeks where you can get a lot of information from those patients either transabdominally or actually transvaginally to get the anatomy. And we have done some work here uh, with Dr. Letty, who, uh, who was uh, our MFM fellow, did a large study on uh, the ability of ultrasound to detect abnormalities and to assess normality in the first trimester. I think her paper was published in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine last year. Uh, we, in, in patients with large BMIs, above 40, we tend to do an early anatomy ultrasound somewhere between 13 and 15 weeks transvaginally to look at the anatomy at that time. Hi, Vladimir, I see you're on. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think I've addressed all the questions. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to joining the webinar. I really enjoyed uh, being part of it. Thank you. Kathy? Yes, and thank you so much, Dr. Abahamid, for this great lecture. And our thanks to all of you who participated today. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. We'll join us again for future webinars. So long, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.